Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, before we uh, begin, a few things to keep in mind. Um, I see there are seats empty in the front, so those in the back, if you could um, move up front uh, so that people joining us later can easily sit in the back. Mm. Okay. Uh, so please put your phones on silent mode. Um, the loos are on the right. Tea, coffee, and snacks are available um, in the cafeteria behind you and the smoking area is out and to your left. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end, so please wait for the mic to be handed to you before you um, begin asking a question. Um, right, so welcome to our panel, uh, Fiction for the Future, uh, Conversations on Climate Fiction. Uh, we will look at how uh, CLIFI can start conversations around climate change, and we'll talk about the contributions from India to uh, this genre. Um, so we have a fantastic lineup uh, for this session today, and it's my pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, Shubhangi Swaroop is uh, an author, journalist, and educator. Latitudes of Longing, uh, her debut novel, was an international bestseller and won the Sushila Devi Award for Best Fiction Written by a Woman, and the Tata Literature Live Award for Debut Fiction, and was shortlisted for the JCB Prize for Indian Literature. Uh, she's based in Mumbai. Uh, Lavanya Lakshmi Narayan uh, is the award-winning author of uh, Analog, Virtual, and Other Simulations of Your Future, which was featured on Tor.com's Best Books of 2021 list. She's a Locus Award finalist and is the first science fiction writer to win the Times of India Author Award and the Valley of Words Award. Mm, she's also been nominated for the BSFA Award, and her work has been translated into French, Italian, Spanish, and German. Um, when uh, Bijal Vachrajnani is not reading a children's book, she's editing or writing one. She's the author of multiple planet-friendly books, including A Cloud Called Bura, which won her the author uh, Children's Book Award 2020. Um, Savi and the Memory Keeper and Kitten Trouble um, are also books that she's authored. Uh, as a commissioning editor at Pratham Books, uh, she dreams up picture books, and she's now a certified climate warrior. Um, our moderator for this afternoon's discussion is Chani Singh. Uh, Chani works at IHS on climate change, um, how it affects us, and ways to reduce its impacts. She's an avid reader, enjoys communicating climate science for lay audiences, and is a published poet. She strongly believes in the power of storytelling to make sense of our present and reimagine our future. Most recently, she's been a lead author on the IPCC Climate Report, which uh, synthesizes the latest science on climate impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. So over to you, Chandni. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lubna. And it's a, a great honor to be joined by people whose work I've read and enjoyed so much. Um, I'm going to set the context first, and then I'll go over a set of questions I have for each one of our panelists, and then open it out for discussion with all of you. Thank you for coming here on a Saturday, and it's really heartening to see that people are concerned about the state of our environment, the state of our planet, and what fiction can do to make sense of this world that we are in. So for context, I guess, uh, my day job is all about writing about climate change, understanding about it, and what we say really is that we are in the Anthropocene. So we have changed our Earth and our planet to such an extent that we've actually thought about naming an entire epoch the Anthropocene, which is that an epoch or an era where human beings have really changed the way our planet functions, the way we make sense of our resources, and uh, it's really a litany of uh, heat waves and floods, extreme rainfall, cyclones. I mean, we are no strangers to all these things. Our newspapers talk about this every day. And while the Anthropocene has the word anthro in it, which is so human-centric, there's also a lot of non-human damage that we are causing because of climate change, but also just environmental degradation. So again, forests being degraded, soil becoming more infertile. So there's this, I guess, uh, just uh, if, you, if you start reading the literature around this, it's just a, a story of deep devastation and very unequal devastation also, I'd like to add. Um, recognizing this, it's always the story of doom and gloom that I end up talking about when I speak about climate change. But I feel that novels and storytelling 
is really one way to make sense of this difficult time that we live in and also start reimagining what can we do to get out of this crisis that we are in. Stories hold a lot of power. They have power to change how we envision futures, what values we hold, and I think all three of you do that in very different ways in your work, and that's why we invited you to be uh, part of this panel. Uh, so first up, I think I'm going to uh, turn to Shubhangi and her beautiful book, Latitudes of Longing. Uh, which starts in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, where there is uh, Girja Prasad Verma, who's a scientist, and he's tasked with setting up the Indian Forest Service post-independence. Uh, really, Shubang, you take us through a natural history of these beautiful islands, documenting histories of forests and turtles and fishes, and also the people of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Um, in your acknowledgement, you beautifully write that the muse of this novel is our unassuming planet, a being that bears more beauty, magic, and resilience than this human mind can fathom, which I found absolutely beautiful and a really rich quote to start this session on. So why do you make nature and the planet such a uh, center of your story, and why is nature a protagonist almost equal to the other people in, in latitudes of longing. Hello, yeah. So I think it's a reflection of the Anthropocene that you even need to ask me this question that why is nature a character when actually we are the, you know, minor characters in the story. Um, I feel like to add to what you are saying, all our stories are only set in the Anthropocene. And it's this uh, great delusion we've built ourselves that this is all that exists on the planet. And if we don't exist, all we've we have uh, equated human history with the history of the planet, human survival with the survival of all the species and elements. And that's, uh, I think, also a remarkable delusion of our storytelling and the modern plot and the novel, I would say. So um, in my novel, the narrative thread is a tectonically active fault line. So that's why it begins in the Andaman Islands, then it goes into Myanmar, then Nepal and then Ladakh. And uh, I live in Bombay. I don't know why I was, um, what shall I say, deluded or crazy enough to think I can plot places on a tectonically active fault line, go live there and write about it, and let that take the story forward rather than um, human plots. But that is what I tried to do. And in doing so, I realized that um, we need to work towards a new language that can accommodate the sciences, that can accommodate oral histories, that can accommodate nature. You know, like, I give this very simple example. If I say Starbucks, everyone knows what it means. But if I use the word origine, which is the process of mountain building, or I try to use some word related to a natural process, it uh, generally raises eyebrows. So it's about pushing the boundaries of what is normally read. That was one challenge I faced. Another challenge was um, having non-human characters writing about the elements as characters in a story and um, giving it the right space in our story. Like, just to give another simple example, the Himalayas shaped me more than my political boundaries, which are as old as my dad right now, political borders. But once you try, even if, if you try to do something which seems quite intuitive like that by working with our natural, um, you know, the natural, what do you call, um, topographies that shape us, um, I didn't realize how political it can get by just doing these little things. And uh, thinking beyond cause and effect, like one of the big uh, problems that I face actively is uh, dealing with deep time. 
which means looking beyond the Anthropocene, the Eocene, the Hadean era, all of that, because the story of the planet is working at a very different time scale from ours, and our brain can't even fathom that. There's even research saying that students of sciences do not understand geological time. I, I've, every time I think I understand it, by next week I've forgotten it, because I'm not, you know, we're not wired to think in such a large time scale. We're not wired to think of the processes at play. So to, to you know, I think fiction and artists have this um, superpower, which if we use well, you know, we can reimagine, we can actually rewire and bring in more con interconnections. This way of like cause effect, we did this, that happened, it does not help. I guess right now the biggest challenge is to even see interconnections. Like uh, why is the turtle's story related to mine? Just a simple question like that, which I'm, I hope and I'm sure many of you agree that our stories are related, but when we try to put it on the page, um, it seems like a bit artificial and that speaks about how artificial our stories are right now. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that really reflects a lot of what we write in the climate change literature, which is around systems, but it's so, and this interconnectedness that you talk about. But we write it in very dry language, and you do it so eloquently, I think, in the book, which is, mm -hmm. which is lovely to see. Uh, but I want to pick up on one more point you mentioned, which is that you use, uh, so when you read the book, and I'm sure many of you have, uh, Shubangi talks uh, or uses insights from science, from experiential knowledge, folklore, mysticism, uh, ghosts are talking, there's a yeti, so there is these different types of knowledges really that you draw on. And we've been talking about this again as climate scientists, that we don't need to privilege the sciences but talk about indigenous knowledge, uh, wisdom from the past, folklore, mm -hmm. and yet we aren't able to do that when we think of our solutions. So just if you could reflect a bit upon why did you think it's important to draw on these and then what that did for your story. I think it's the left and the right side of the brain complementing each other. That's the way I treat it. The folklore and the role of uh, creation myths and on one side and hard science on the other. I am a being of the 21st century, so I, I rely on both aspects. As I describe my novel, I call it a creation myth based on science. And I don't privilege the sciences over the creation myths or vice versa. I think what... Um, so I made it a point for all the years, I wrote for seven years, I made it a point not to read anything written in English language. I relied a lot on oral histories, places I went. I had to um, teach myself to be a better listener and not just in conversations, but even in a situation, if I'm sitting under a tree, what is the tree or the shell or the mountain telling me in its story? And of course, it takes the poetic license of a ghost, but those are devices we use to uh, communicate these uh, forms of knowledge that come to us. So um, I have a strong suspicion we've reached here because of this imbalance. The science is extremely on the science side, and the creation or the creative ones are the, the Bollywood kind. You know, the, we need to, the two actively need to engage. So, um, or else we will again go off route. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's back to that issue of the dichotomy of trying to. Just to even add to that, one simple thing of sentience, you know, I, like history is littered with examples of um, like Jane Goodall, one of her discoveries was that uh, animals have personalities. Before that, we had scientists whose big discoveries were that plants are living, mm -hmm. which I guess even like, as you know, children, and if we just think, if we just think even with a little common sense, it seems lo a logical conclusion to reach. But um, for some reason, you know, we've gone down the scientific route of plucking out the antennae of ants to prove some experiments and things, you know, when it, I mean, 
Even if we just sat, we would reach similar conclusions. And I find this idea of self-awareness, sentience, human beings being the most sentient, hence responsible and, uh, you know, worth saving to be very problematic. It's a problem of philosophy, I feel, uh, what we value as sentience, because to me, an element does not willfully damage me. So that's an example of the water sentience, because I am capable of harm. But um, it's a problem where I feel the arts and philosophy will have to intervene with science. I don't know who's caused this problem, but I take it very personally to try to challenge this. That's where the folklores and the creation myths and this kind of, you know, uh, using a lot of literary devices to give an alternate point of view come yeah. to help. Yeah, and it comes across very clearly, I think, in your writing, where we're decentering the human gaze and the story only coming from a human point of view. And many people actually have also criticized this word, the Anthropocene, because it puts human beings at the center rather than actually decentering them as you talk about. Um, my last question to you, and then we'll move on, is around, you did allude to it, this treatment of time in your work and the slowness uh, that is, it's a slowness, but uh, I would say maybe it's an unhurried way of writing and the stories that you're writing unfurling, which is beautiful to witness. And many people have been talking about the need for fiction and novels when we talk about climate change, because they move away from the more journalistic kind of writing we see, which is focused on one event, has to be fast paced, has to have a catchy headline, so many people dying because of X, Y, Z. Many people for this recent heat wave have been asking me, but tell me about the deaths. You can be talking about heat stress and just feeling exhausted because of heat, but tell me about, so journalism brings a certain pace to the climate story, to the Anthropocene. But your writing is much slower, and you've written uh, in the book what happens every few hundred years just happened yesterday and can happen again tomorrow. Um, so if you could just talk about how you deal with time and why do you take this very expansive view of time really in the book? Um, once again, the, um, you know, you're literally hitting on all the sore spots of writing because uh, time is a huge, huge... Uh, challenge in, in term, uh, deep time is a huge challenge and to view it as time space or what we call, yeah, gravity, time space, all those, to, to view a story, I won't even say life, to view a story in that scope is, um, our plot is a very deficient device. A plot generally has some cause or effect, and all of it has to lie on the page. So if you don't mention the sun in your page for some reason, it doesn't impact your story. That's how limited we've got with the way we write our stories. So um, mm, I suspect if we can um, accommodate ways of expanding our idea of time, and I think fiction or stories can do a good job at that, we may have a we may have a shot at understanding processes that go way beyond human lives. Um, there was something I wanted to say about this. So, um, okay, I, one thing I keep saying is what I find the role of fiction like mine is if you don't, if you are not in love with, if you are not curious or in awe of the planet, then how can you save it? You you know, then it's just uh, lip service or some kind of conscientious activity. So to fall in love with these um, aspects, one has to appreciate this much larger scope where the shell and the star and the gecko are also part of the world that I inhabit. And to do that, we have to break down as a we literally have to break down these walls and the roof so we can stand under the sky i don't think it's possible without that and i feel it also gives me hope to know that i am a limited being and my ego is even more limited so it's about the larger picture yeah thank you so much for that i think at least when i read the book i felt that way this this um feeling of uh, rec recognizing your own 
finite, limited self and the, just the breadth of what is outside and trying to value that in a different way than what we uh, value it right now, just seeing trees as, instead of only seeing trees as places that provide refuge for human beings, to see them as beyond that and so on. Um, so I'd like you to read a small passage from your book, which uh, at least to me had brought this, um, this idea of drawing on multiple knowledges and languages to the fore. So if you could please, Shivangi. Sure. So you've picked the passage from the Andaman Islands where um, it's about the ghost of a, uh, a colonial ghost. Yeah. So um, it's about Lord Mayo actually sitting on Mount Harriet and looking at the sunset before he's murdered and um, having experienced the most, one of the most beautiful moments of his life, which of course I've taken a fictional leap with. So only another Lord could have sympathized with Lord Mayo's plight. His voyages had shown good enough, who's the other Lord, that inventing new names didn't completely solve the English language's crisis of inarticulacy. His mother tongue, he suspected, was incapable of expressing the complexities that lay dormant in a single word. It could not, for instance, describe snow the way the Eskimos did with their dozen synonyms. It did not see the diversity that fell with each flake nor had the English language experienced strains in the, way, in, in the way the people in the Straits of Malacca had. Their word for heaven met sublime rain, and hell was rain that drowned. All, ra all life was an oscillation between the two. No word, certainly not the innocuous love, could be used to describe the all-powerful, all-consuming force Lord Goodenough had encountered in the Pacific. It wasn't mere cannibalism, the ritual of eating the beloved's heart. In the same way, it wasn't solitude that one experienced on Mount Harriet. In the presence of a purple sun, the nature of solitariness itself seemed to expand unless, until it included everything on the island. All the life forms, mountains, rivers, lagoons, beaches, forests, even the boulder peering down from Mount Harriet's peak into the rainforest's abyss. It was the solitude of an archipelago, separated from all islands, no, sorry, separated from all lands by an ocean bigger than any continent, sitting under a sky bigger than all the oceans and continents combined. As vast as the universe, the solitude transformed into the meditations of the universe. Thank you so much. If you haven't read this book, I, it's, it's a treat to read, and it's, uh, it just puts you in a different pace, I think. Even the name itself, to me, that it called out, Latitudes of Longing. So it's, it's a tremendous, tremendous book, which yeah, I, I really enjoyed. All right, moving on to Lavanya's very different book, which is called Analog Virtual. Um, yeah, and there's, yeah, if you can just pass it, yeah. Analog virtual uh, and other simulations of our future. So the book is, uh, it's based in Bangalore. Bangalore is no longer called Bangalore City, but it's Apex City. It's into the future where we have uh, really seen devastating climate change. Uh, the Bell Corporation has taken over the management of Bangalore. It's run by a corporation. Uh, it's a very divided society. There are people, the top 10 percenters, who have access to cool homes and clean air. And then there are the bottom rung of people who really are fighting over water and food and just uh, living in very cramped conditions. So although it's a future, it's also very much uh, rooted, I think, in present-day Bangalore, where we've, where we've got gated communities on one end and informal settlements on the other. Um, so coming to, uh, coming to you, really, to um, first of all, I'd like to say that in Apex City or Bangalore City in the future is really a city, it's a picture of a city in ruin. You talk about uh, this a city deeply divided, there's been a cholera epidemic, unclean drinking water, rolling clouds of dust, 
uh, analogs having no conception of trees, which to me was a really powerful picture because we know Bangalore as the garden city. So it's really a difficult uh, world that you have imagined. And I wanted to ask you what drove this vision of Bangalore and how did you construct this very different Bangalore, maybe very same Bangalore, really? Uh, thank you. Um, so I grew up in Bangalore. This is my home city. I've been here for 30 years. And so I've seen its transition from you know the tiny town of the 90s where um, we had tree-lined avenues, um, tons of shade, to the rampant development that it's been undergoing uh, while the city expands outwards over the last few decades. Um, I've seen its traffic. Uh, I mean, this is a first-hand experience. I've witnessed it um, become unmanageable. We've got some of the worst traffic anywhere in the world. And so it wasn't too much of a stretch of my imagination to project this very, very um, stark and sort of ravaged Bangalore. Um, this book is set in the future. I'm thinking maybe about 100 to 150 years out. Um, unfortunately, I feel like we're already very well on that path to getting there. And I don't intend to be a prophet of doom when I write um, about Bangalore like this. Um, I intend it to be a warning of what could happen if we continue unchecked in the manner that we have over the last few decades. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can see so many shades of the Bangalore we know right now over here. As you mentioned, Chandni, um, gated communities. There are entire buildings that do not have access to water. Um, and I don't remember water being such a scarcity um, back when I was growing up here. We've got lakes catching fire filled with garbage, all right? That's, that's absolutely mortifying from an environmental standpoint in a city that is considered to be the garden city. And all of this kind of, when I decided to write a book set in Bangalore, um, everything that I had observed over the last 20 years of, let's say, consciousness in the city um, just bled through onto the page. Um, because I am terrified of us tending towards a future that is so unsustainable, where um, the privileged have limitless access to environmental solutions, but we leave people who do not have privilege on you know, and this could be privilege on any basis. In my book, um, privilege is gated on technology. So technology is the line that divides the haves from the have-nots. Um, right now, we have so many other markers of privilege. Um, and it is terrifying to think that uh, those of us who possess certain types of privilege will withstand whatever climate change throws at us. You know, we will have the money, we will have the luxury to access things like clean drinking water, maybe a roof over our heads, air conditioning. Um, but people who don't have that privilege, um, they are already suffering today. And it will only progressively get worse as the climate crisis continues to run unchecked. Um, tiny examples like the heat wave in Delhi right now, every time we experience floods anywhere in the country, this is all already happening. Um, I, you know, I buy into what uh, Ursula Le Guin, who is one of my biggest influences when it comes to speculative fiction, she says that all science fiction is metaphor. And to me, um, I believe very strongly in science fiction that mirrors reality and lets us glimpse into a little part of ourselves in a world whose rules are somewhat unfamiliar to our own. Um, and so that's why you know, I, I could see Bangalore going there and decided to write about it in this way. Thanks so much. One of the big things that you bring in, and I think uh, it's also from your own background working in technology, is a lot of technological solutions are provided in the book. So you have a sunshield umbrella. You have climate tech fabric. You have uh, all kinds, I mean, there's so many of them, and then there's this Karnatak meridian between the haves and the have-nots, and you move from one side to another, and the meridian really crackles each time you go in, and there are these yeah, high-tech uh, ways, I mean, they, they read all your data, and you move from one part to another, and actually towards, all right, I won't, I won't talk about the end, <laughs> because I want you all to read it. Um, but can you talk a bit about the role of technology in solutions, and again, that, uh, this idea of technology being available to certain people and not to others. 
this is something that's very close to my heart, uh, this disparity in technology and the people who get to access it, but also the people who get to design it and for what intent technology is designed. Um, you know, in very stark contrast to your book, Shibangi, where you say, you know, geological time scale, um, zooming out and viewing things from a non-anthropocentric perspective. This is set in a world where productivity is paramount. So you've got to be productive. So time functions on a very micro scale. Every second counts. Again, projecting from where we locate ourselves today, um, there is a culture of instant gratification seeping in compared to the natural rhythms of the world. So for example, where once upon a time, we would grow our own vegetables and let them take their natural cycle um, and harvest what we need and eat what we need. We're currently living in a world where we can get any fruit or any vegetable we want at any time of the year, on demand delivered by a home delivery app that brings it right to your doorstep. Um, and this is, you know, accounting for a carbon footprint that takes into, you know, the travel required, um, the kind of infrastructure required to genetically modify these, um, all of this produce to grow at any point in time um, against its natural cycle. So in this world where um, I, I guess you have all this access to instant gratification, all of this technology plays this role of furthering that divide um, of privilege between the haves and the have-nots, where the haves continue to experience instant gratification on a massive scale. And this also takes the form of these climate solutions. So the haves have instant gratification wherein on their side of the Carnatic Meridian, um, they've got this sun shield umbrella. So it's filtering ultraviolet light, it's giving them a better quality of life. The have-nots on the other side um, live with heat waves, they have dust storms, they have no climate solutions available to them. The haves again have access to, you know, smart climate intelligent fabric. They've got access to trees. There's an entire arboretum that is gated to only them, but the have-nots, most of them have no conception of a tree. And this again speaks to when technology is being designed. It is being designed for a certain set of people who have purchasing power, who have the ability to access it, to buy it, and it is also being designed by these people. So you are never accounting for the wider population as users, as consumers of technology, and as stakeholders in what they need from technology. As long as a corporation, and we're looking at tons of them all the way from Apple to Samsung to, you know, you name your big corporation, all their design is top down to push a certain type of aspiration towards a certain type of consumer. But they never take into account, you know, what somebody, um, let's say, what a farmer growing their own produce, supplying produce to a massive part of society, what they might need. And even when there are apps that do this, you know, um, a lot of them come to us sitting in India from the West. Um, they don't take into account ground reality. And uh, this is very concerning to me. And that's why I write about technology in this way, uh, to kind of reflect this concern on the page. Yeah, and it comes across very strongly, I must say. Um, we, we are seeing it now. I, I, air conditioning and heat waves for me are the classic example of uh, access to a certain technology which has existed for a long time, just being unavailable for certain people. Um, the last question I have, uh, but maybe first I would like you to read out because you mentioned the Arbor. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to uh, stumble over the word. People having tr uh, access to trees and some people not, not seeing them at all. So if you could read out and then I'll ask my last question. Sure. This is from uh, right at the beginning of the book. Um, like we said, there is a, an electric shield called the Carnatic Meridian that separates the haves and the have-nots. Um, and uh, my character in this excerpt is um, walking from one side to the other. She passes through the Meridian Gate. The light dims abruptly. A wave of coolth rushes over her. The sun shield umbrella orbits Apex City. It protects the virtual side from the ultraviolet radiation, providing climatic conditions optimized for human performance. 
her people, are exposed to heat waves and dust storms. 26 towers form rank into the heart of the city. Thousands of employees are ensconced in biomat and frosted glass spirals, absorbed in holotech experiences. A block of pod houses shares a cellular phone. The arboretum curves on either side of her, all along the city's borders. Thousands of trees flower in desolation. Most analogs have no conception of a tree. They rely on the memories of virtuals who have been deported to their side of the city. They hang on to the descriptions of a handful of workers who make their way through the meridian each day. She makes for the teleportals, virtuals edge away from her grubby, shabbily dressed person. I will not claim their hollow watches. I have a bigger prize in mind today, she thinks. Thanks so much. Um, so when we think about this vision of Bangalore, we can take away from it. There are, of course, uh, it's, it's a very rich set of characters that you have. Some of them, all of them actually, even the ones, uh, the most privileged, as well as the ones who are right at the bottom, they're all also having their own moral dilemmas of where we are, what we have access to, what is right, what is wrong. Um, what I wonder what your readers and you yourself have thought about how speculative fiction can be a vehicle of despair where you see this really difficult future for a city that we know and love and live in, or a vehicle of hope. And uh, I'd like to read a quote by Octavia Butler where she says that uh, telling narratives of the future can be an act of hope, the very act of trying to look ahead, to discern possibilities and offer warnings is itself an act of hope. And I think you do that in some ways in your book, but if you could talk about uh, where do you see hope really in the story? And uh, I know there are various instances in the story. So if you could just tell us a bit more about that. Thank you. Um, so when I wrote this book, this was pre-pandemic. Um, and it released two weeks before we went into lockdown. And the minute we went into lockdown, this book took on a whole new scale of meaning to me personally because a lot of the stark realities I was writing about, um, existing in isolation when you have this bubble of tech privilege around you, people who don't have technology struggling and suffering and really su uh, sort of experiencing the brunt of a harsh, cruel world, that was immediate reality. I did not imagine that that would be reality, you know, two weeks after the book released. I was thinking, give it 10 years, I hope we don't get there, but we got there almost instantly. and. Um, that was personally very bleak for me to experience. Um, I did have readers get back to me um, saying that it hit really close to home for them as well, especially experiencing lockdown, um, experiencing the pandemic, seeing what people without privilege had to endure during the pandemic. Uh, so it was very stark for them as well. But having said that, there is a revolution that takes place in the book the have-nots do attempt to improvise their own technology, which while not as sophisticated as the technology being handed down to them from the corporations, is more grassroots level. It addresses their immediate needs. And a lot of readers found that as very hope-inspiring. Um, because if we can do that, if we can decentralize the creation of technology, and technology of all sorts, you know, convenience technology is uh, technological solutions to really make them feel more local and address immediate concerns uh, for people to whom that technology is most relevant, then I think there might be hope uh, for what we can accomplish um, despite the climate crisis having gotten so bad already. Um, so that, that brought about hope. Um, a lot of the characters, as you mentioned, do have their own moral dilemmas. They are conflicted, whether they occupy the top rungs or the bottom rungs of society. They understand the costs involved of operating from where they are located. Um, and that, I, a lot of people said that resonated with them because that sense of self-awareness um, that you can change, that you can be better. Um, it, it, I, I wrote that because I believe we have the capacity to do that. Um, we just need to make the choice to do it. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think this idea of 
all people holding agency is uh, very, it comes out very strongly in the story and i think it's it's also what we have been saying in in a lot of climate change projects that you need to allow the agency of the most vulnerable really to uh, you know support that rather than just have these top down technocratic solutions really so thank you so much for that thank you and then moving on to bijal Bijal's uh, books are always, I really look forward to them. They, they have so much humor, but they also, uh, yeah, pull on so much great science. So I think Bijal, it's always, it's always a pleasure to read your very smart writing, funny and Thank smart, you. I would say. It's, it's not just humor, but it's also just drawing on a lot of good science uh, to write these very complex stories for a very different audience, uh, which is children. Um, so I am going to focus on cl a cloud called Bhura, but of course uh, we, there are a range of books and Bijal will read out from uh, another book as well. So in cloud called Bhura, there's this big brown cloud that is hanging over Mumbai city. With it has come um, just really noxious gases, acid rain, birds are fleeing the city, uh, everyone's feeling suffocated. So it's this, uh, it's, it's the epitome of, I think, a problem and especially in our cities and then over the course of the story of course there are a range of actors who come in from politicians to scientists to parents and uh, really this group of four kids who are taking on this problem and then they you know there's there's the whole story of how they how they deal with it and how they talk to their friends and family about it so the first uh, question i guess when i read buddha is that why does Bijal continue to write these stories? They are such important stories, but we don't see enough of them. What, what really motivates you to write about climate change, environmental issues for really small, small readers, young readers? Um, I really don't know. <laughs> but uh, I've always believed in children as an audience. I used to be the kids reporter at Time Out. I worked with Kids for Tigers at Sanctuary Asia. And I have gone into classrooms as part of my work to report, to listen. And I always come back with this overwrought feeling that children are awesome. All of you are awesome, really. Because every time I listen to them, they're just like, ma'am, did you hear? This is what they did. And did you know? Or sometimes they come to me and say, sign this petition. The tigers are dying. And I'm like, it's my petition, but I will sign it, yes. So I always come back with this feeling of, you know, if there's any hope left in this world, it's with this demographic, it's with our children. Yeah. So I always wanted to tell stories of, of environment. I used to, I wanted to tell stories of animals. And somehow it just made sense to write for an audience which cares, but also has that, my favorite person is Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. And you know, she talks about how children have that inherent sense of wonder. And I always wanted to explore that ecosystem of the child, that, you know, everything's new to a child. Like, right now, there was this one butterfly or moth that was doing the rounds of this room. And I was just watching as to how many people were like, you know, we had this sudden childlike wonder as this poor thing was dashing against speakers, wondering where is this vibration coming from. But that's what children do. They get excited about nature. And I wanted to speak to them, and that's why I keep writing. And every time I leave a classroom, whether it's online, whether it's offline, I come back even more determined that this is my constituency. They're amazing, and I think that's reflected in what we are seeing across the world, whether it's Greta Thunberg, whether it's Rhythma Pandey. They're the ones who've taken up the cudgels and says, boss, this is our future. You don't mess with it, you change things. I just want to tell stories to fuel those imaginations. Yeah, that's, that's really wonderful. And I think uh, single-handedly, some of these youth activists have done much more for the climate story than yeah, thousands of scientists have been able to do. So definitely agree with you on that. Um, of course, while children bring wonder and uh, just curiosity to these questions, some of the things you write about are also difficult reading. They're also about really Bhura the cloud is making life miserable in Bombay. So uh, what kinds of reactions do you see? For me, I would think there's anger about these kinds of problems. There's fear. There's uh, despair at how bad things are getting. And then perhaps moving on to hope. 
but uh, how do you deal with these? And then, of course, you, because the readership is so young, how do you balance that whole idea of not making it, you know, um, uh, to deal with this issue of despair and fear with hope as well? So if you could talk about that. You know, that's such a great question because it only hits me after the book is out because when I'm writing, it's all in my head. It's all horrible. I, I have no idea where it's going. And I'm like, there'll be some reader somewhere. 2019 is when uh, 900, uh, Delhi touched 900 EQI, right? I went to Bookaroo, which is this other children's literature festival. My room was full of children who came and literally almost all of them uh, said, ma'am, uh, we are here because we want to know what's happening. Why is it happening? One boy said, you know, I have asthma. My ch parents took me away. And uh, during this time, I missed school, but I missed my friends. And every time I come back here, it hurts. But this is home. And this was such a young boy telling me his story and trusting that I would have the answer, perhaps, which felt like a huge responsibility. Another person recently reached out to me saying that he's reading Savi and the Memory Keeper, which is about a girl who loses her father and it's also about climate change. And he said he started reading it with a girl who had lost her father during the pandemic. And suddenly, you know, these questions of nature and climate grief and your personal grief started cropping up. So there are these huge responsibilities as children's authors that we don't tend to realize and we try to, I think, um, we know it at the back of our head, but it's something that we just don't, because if you tell ourselves, I think we'll all go hide under the bed and say, let's not write, which many of us do. <laughs> so, um, but I think for me, what's important is that one, I don't want to ever dumb down to the audience. Um, I always want to sit with them and talk when I'm writing because I feel like that's what children want. They want to be heard through their stories. And that's what I try to do. And one of the things that, like what both Lavanya and Shubangi said, I think for me it's hope. And being a very cynical, very pessimistic person, my stories always end amb ambiguously, but there's always that sliver of hope that I need to give because what else can we give our children? We're giving them a very messed up planet. Let's give them some hope. So that's where it comes from. Yeah, and I think your books do bring that out. Yeah, especially Bhura. I really enjoyed that, the last bit. Uh, I think one of the things that, uh, and we discussed, we were discussing it before this panel, is that often a lot of children's writing around climate change and environmental issues tends to have this burden of also providing some kind of awareness about these issues. Is it educational material? How are these children going to use this information? Is it factual? Is it not? How do you deal with that? Is that a big burden? And how do you really, because you do bring in a lot of uh, evidenced stuff in, in your books. It's uh, often I'm nodding along to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of you know scientific evidence to back these things she's saying. Thank God. <laughs> We can blame it on my editor, a former editor who's right here, Naresh Fernandez, who would keep asking us, where did you get this from? What is the source? Where is, go deeper into the story. And so I, as a journalist, you get trained into finding facts, uh, looking into, you know, where did this thing happen from? Why did it happen? And I feel like children have the same thing. They have questions, right? They're constantly like, but why? But why you did this? But why is this happening? And so that's the kind of curiosity that I tend to channel in my books as well. Um, also, the moment you say you're writing about the environment, literally everyone wants you to write nonfiction. They'll just be like, write things that will help you save the planet. 365 ways to help the, save the planet, one activity a day. And uh, I'm just like, that's great, but uh, you know, that's not gonna help. <laughs> But the second thing is I want to write fiction because I think that what we're seeing right now in the world is so funny. It's tragic. It's like a black comedy. And if we can't use that into stories, like, you know, a politician saying that the Asian brown cloud is, a, is propaganda from the West is a fact. And if we can't use that into fiction, what are we doing as writers? And a lot of people come to me and say, oh, but these are characters who are much older for children to resonate with. Children love them. Mm. They love the journalist, they love the politician, they love the actors I throw in, I think because they're constantly observing. So yeah, lots of research goes in and then I 
toss all of that out aside into one folder and then I start writing. And then how do the adults take it? What about the parents? Where do they come into this equation? So it's really interesting because I'm often in rooms where there'll be children as well as the adults with them. And there's a point in Bura where I pause and I talk about this brown cloud coming and it's this noxious cloud and everybody's trying to take selfies with it and it sounds horrible. And then I stop and say, what would you do? Almost every child in the classroom will say, I want to know what it is. I think it's this, I think it's pollutants and I think it's ash but I want to know what more it is. I said, child, now that you know what it is, what would you like to do next? So they'll be like, we'll find out more, then we'll try and talk to people, we'll tell our teachers. I'll say, how many of you leave the uh, city? All the adults will raise their hands. <laughs> First thing, run. Yeah, and children will want to investigate, but they'll want to question, and I think that is the difference where the adults constantly feel the need to keep these children safe, but the children are like, no, we're, we're going to take control. Wonderful. Uh, I'd now like you to read, read the passage from uh, Savi and the Memory Keeper. So I've changed the passage I was going to read because I just thought that slightly different because everyone was reading such beautiful stuff. So this is completely opposite to that. Um, Savi and the Memory Keeper set in a fictional city. It's called Shajarpur. I wanted to write about a city with a perfect climate. And earlier I set it in Bangalore. Then I tried setting it in Bombay and I said, this is not working. Nothing's working. So we're going to rewrite it and make it Shajarpur. And they're really trying to save this one tree who you can see on the cover, drawn beautifully by Raji Vibe. And uh, something was very wrong. Uncle 97 was late. He stepped into a dark room where a shiny disco ball flashed diamond shards of light across the dark dance floor. He blinked in rapid succession and quickly pulled on his sunglasses. Music pulsed through the room. Bollywood and pop numbers from the 80s. He smiled to see his friends from the League of Extraordinary Uncles and two aunties. They were boogieing away. Everyone except uncle number 34 who sat grumpily in a corner chomping on a paneer tikka. Everyone was aha dancing dancing. Awa awa, all hands up in the air. Awa awa, all legs moving to the right. Awa, awa, all doing a nagin dance. TLEU, ATA, was celebrating, was celebrating. Uncle nine, number 97 joined them quickly. Bang, bang, trees were dying. The darn tree's death day was close. Bang, bang, more buildings, more flyovers, more concrete. Statue. Uncle number 35 announced, holding his hand up and striking a pose like Elvis. Everyone immediately froze. No, no, not the game. I mean, we must build a statue to commemorate our work. Everyone unfroze and cheered. Yes, more statues, more. Everyone raised their hands in the air and resumed dancing. Tree knew their days were numbered. They knew, they knew the tree's days were numbered. It was definitely a gold letter day. Awa, awa. Thank you so much. I think we should just end there after that lovely <laughs> narration. Yeah. And uh, I know we are, yeah, we, we, we are close to lunchtime and I'd like to take a couple of questions. So just one final round of questions to each one of you. I think I'd like to go back to what we started with, which was the Anthropocene and this need for the novel, for storytelling, for writers to really write, uh, for us to understand uh, how, uh, I mean, make sense of the Anthropocene, but then also make sense of different visions out of this Anthropocene, really. So um, Kim Stanley Robinson, who's recently written The Ministry for the Future, and everyone who's talking about the heat wave wants to know if we have, Indians have read Kim Stanley Robinson, I guess, which is troublesome to me. But he has, of course, he's written a lot of uh, science fiction even before this one. And he's, he says that stories change the structure of feeling, which to me is really powerful because I think that in the climate crisis, we really need 
to change and use stories to change how we feel about our relationship to nature, our relationship to one another, and then again, where do we go from here? So my question is very broad, and please interpret it as you want, but really, where do we go from here? As fiction writers, as people who tell stories, what is the role of the writer in the Anthropocene? And uh, do you really think that writing can change values? I mean, is it just putting too much on you writers to now also bring in the Anthropocene and think about changing how we think about the future? Or who, do, who wants to go first? <laughs> I know it's a big one. Um, OK, so I, I write science fiction. I write about the future a lot. I cannot write about a future without acknowledging its past. And its past is our present. Um, since most of my fiction happens in uh, some kind of secondary world, whether it's based on time or space, um, I need to know what kind of environment informs it. I need to know what kind, how it shapes the behaviors of people. I need to know how it impacts um, everything from what they wear to their moods. Um, and so I cannot, I, I find it impossible to write without taking into account um, the world they are living in. Um, and I think, you know, before we had this discussion, uh, Shivangi did say that we need to normalize bringing these aspects into fiction and not necessarily treating it as its own subgenre, which exclusively deals with the climate. Why can't all fiction take into account um, what, do you want to continue yeah. on that? Yeah, because actually, I found it maybe as a follow-up to Shubhangi, really, you said that relegating everything that is in anything to do with the environment, anything to do with climate change, ends up going. I mean, this this whole creation of a genre like uh, climate fiction, which perhaps doesn't work at all. Yeah, so, I found that very powerful, Shubhangi. So <laughs> I don't know if you yeah. want to. Um, okay. Um, you know, I like. I cannot be someone else's conscience keeper. We all have to, like, my writing stems from a deep reflection of myself and my, my place in the universe. And um, it's connected to this, uh, you know, this climate fiction. Like, though I write uh, with a similar preoccupation, I find it quite disturbing that a sub-genre or a genre should exist because it points out to me that the best sellers and the mainstream genre are not accommodating these questions. So um, that is my hope, you know, when, the, when every book has uh, some idea of uh, altitudes and temperatures and is situating us in the larger context. And that's my critique of uh, climate fiction. It, um, like the example I was giving before, we don't look at Lord of the Rings or Lord of the Flies in the context of World War II literature. Both address those issues, but those are also the important works of that time. And um, it would, um, I, w I mean, we need to reflect why our mainstream is not um, is even it's inexcusable to me that it's even called mainstream when it doesn't deal with these issues. That's brilliant, brilliantly put. Yeah. Anything to add, Vijal? I think uh, what we were discussing, I kind of feel like what's happening to literature. Is, you know, first when the f climate science started coming out, everyone said, "Oh, this is the problem of environmentalists. You all go hug a tree. You all then say we, we have to save planet Earth." So we. It became the sidelining of the problems and also of what we have. And I feel like that's happening in fiction also. And uh, it's something I'm actually working on right constantly is that we're suffering from something called environmental generational amnesia, which is apparently a collective forgetfulness of nature where we keep perceiving nature as to the generation we are born into. So um, research actually shows that there are children who think that uh, when they see a fountain, they're like, oh, big water, because they've never actually seen a waterfall. So the, our imaginations have got so restricted. And that's what needs to change for fiction. Fiction just, everything is environment. So we, ex we are not excluded from it. We are part of it. And that's, I think, a systematic 
change that we need to remind ourselves that we are part of nature. We are not like tum, nature is outside, we are inside. Absolutely. And in ACs. Absolutely. Where we are. Uh, I'd like to now, yeah, we have about five, seven minutes. Uh, any questions from the floor? For anybody, really, we can take a couple and then we'll close. Oh, everyone's really hungry and wants to run to lunch. <laughs> All right, yeah, we have a question here. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for bringing all the th these thoughts into the room. It's very important to be uh, talking, especially as Bijil said, to the children. So I just uh, wanted to ask about something. Like you said, you do a lot of reference work, right? You work at what um, what's been said, what's the science that's happening. Uh, I just want to know uh, there are these books which are for children, but they have footnotes where they put the references in. Right, and I've noticed that nowadays uh, children are very eager to do QR code scanning and go online and all. So I just want to know if will it be possible, like for example, if you're talking about let's say a carbon sink, and you say like a forest is a carbon sink, instead of explaining it, if there's a footnote and you can just put something as to you could go here and check it out. I do think that children will take it forward and they'll be able to discover new things on their own. So would that be possible, or is he the person I should be talking to? so much thanks there's one question here please I can use the mic yeah. uh, thanks so this question is for Bijal uh, you know part of my identity is that I've been educator I've worked with children many years ago so pedagogies excite me uh, a lot of what you were talking about I feel you know could expand into the conversations we have in our classrooms or you know in our families so uh, have you seen some of that play out you know in in the lives your fiction your works of fiction have assumed and any generic message you may have, you know, for people who have children around them, parents, caregivers, educators? Sure. Um, to answer your question first, I think uh, we've been exploring this at, actually my day job is with Pratham Books, and we've been exploring how do we QR code some of this stuff. So it is in our mind, but thank you for reinforcing it. Um, technology can sometimes <laughs> be <laughs> for good. Uh, about your question, if you're, as you're asking me for specific examples or just some thoughts on... Uh, you know, it's very simple. Back to my person, Rachel Carson. She said that if a child is to keep alive her, inher her inherent sense of wonder, and I'm paraphrasing to make it her, um, she needs the company of one adult. And uh, I constantly feel that uh, that's what we become. We become as authors, as teachers especially. I think you all do amazing work, librarians, teachers. You all are, you are my heroes. So if you all take that next step to saying, let's step out today and we'll go and just stare at a tree. And suddenly that tree becomes this place of play and learning. There's a bark gecko over there. There's a two-tailed spider over there. There's a copper spit uh, barbet over there. So just using your senses to explore the world around you as teachers, uh, along with children, I kind of feel like that's perhaps the best way to get nature into your classrooms. You don't need to go to a forest. If you can, that's great. But especially in Bangalore, there like, um, except in Lavanya's novel, everywhere there are trees, so use that. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can... Yes, please. Uh, this question is for Shabangi, actually. Uh, you talked about including oral history while you are writing. So, nowadays, when the narrative can be manipulated anyway, how do you decide the credibility of the oral history that you are receiving? Because it keeps on changing with time. So how do you decide the credibility of the sources uh, for the oral history and the narrative that you're getting? See, luckily I work in fiction. So that, that's a huge disclaimer. And also the job of fiction is not to judge. So uh, if it is changing over time, for me, that's a good thing, you know, because no, oral histories are dynamic. It's, um, you know, just capturing it at that point of time. Um, I think these are scientific biases that one, um, what is the idea of authenticity? It's something that's stable across time to fiction. It's more interesting if it changes. Unreliability is a great thing to play with. So I would use 
as a fiction writers a writer i would use that to my advantage and i would look more than authenticity i would look for what is the quirk of that oral history you know oral history means someone is speaking it or singing it so what is the personality of the person behind it we always bring in our personality into something even an insect brings its personality into something so about capturing that 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 um, the living part of it yeah thanks so much any other questions otherwise i'll close the session here Anyway, Hi. Yeah? Sorry. Okay. Yes, please. Um, so, I noticed that uh, all of your narratives, or at least the conversations around the narratives, discussed more about individual agency and individual actors. How do you feel about addressing um, the societal and corporate elements of it? You mentioned uh, about how, like, there's a historical cultural shift away from more natural um, connectedness. with nature uh, so could you guys speak a little yeah. bit about that thanks i think in all your stories actually collective action comes up maybe lavanya do you want to speak? yeah um so in in my novel uh, collective action certainly does take place um but again you know to to comment on what you've said i f- i feel like there is a lot of onus being placed on private citizens in in their individual capacities to address um these climate concerns while um a lot of big corporations can get away with bloody murder and that also translates into my book while there is collective action people come together as a community and try to take back their rights and address the disparity they are experiencing it is still um their own initiative that causes them to form this community which is still a good thing i mean i i think you know what we can do as communities when we come together um is really limitless but at the same time there is a lack of accountability um for people who are already in positions of power um to take these these decisions for the greater good uh, that could really aid the world that we're living in um and so i i personally find it very unfair um i cause people to come together as communities in my book because for me that is the most hope that i have that we will be able to work together regardless of what um corporations do uh, or governments or policy makers or anybody in power yeah and i think bijal uh, uh, yeah i can just quickly all right but i keep giving the giving away the end of the book then which i don't want to do but collective action and political agency plays a big role in a cloud called boda which i think you should read i won't say any more all right with that i will close uh let's give a big round of applause to our panelists thank you so much for joining us it's been really nice and i like that we kind of even before we discussed uh, before we came to the panel we've sort of also converged to say that we don't need to relegate uh climate change stories environmental stories to climate fiction so for a session that was titled conversations of Cli- on climate fiction we've kind of done away with that heading which is really nice <laughs> and i think um, again thank you so much to all of you thank, thank you, you.